No more safety glasses in this classroom. That's when stuff hits me in the face. All right, let's do this here. Whatever, before you put an engine in, before you even decide that the engine needs to be replaced, I mean, would you, uh, sometimes you can basically tell if the engine needs to be replaced just by the way it's, like for instance, the one on that Jeep that uh, Dustin and them changed out was knocking and cutting up and skipping on number three and had no compression and this all kinds of crazy ideas and everything. Uh, but you want to always start with the least intrusive test. See the little notes up here? Uh, less intrusive test means do the tests that are easiest to do. Uh, with the least amount of disassembly, use the results from the last test to drive your decision about which system to test next. If you got, if you're, uh, the WDS stands for Worldwide Diagnostic System, but that's basically like the IDS that I've got now. Uh, if the fuel pressure test indicates a potential fuel pressure concern, look at the fuel filter for a restriction before removing the fuel pump from the tank. It's always good to check the fuel pump, I mean fuel filter first. Okay. Uh, my fuel pump is on the block. It is, on that little old 83 model it is. Okay, inspect the engine for obvious concerns, aftermarket, add-ons, modifications, damaged engine mounts, vacuum leaks, fluid leaks. The stuff That's all the stuff that you're going to see. Uh, on the outside, typically, uh, if a less intrusive, intrusive test indicates a concern, uh, then you're basically going to repair that concern, and you're going to continue with your diagnosis till the exact root cause is determined. You got to go to the, got to find the root of it. Um, a component that's causing the concern may be the symptom of a larger concern, so that's really important. Uh, if the fuel injector stuck open and flowing so much that the oil is washed from the cylinder walls, it may be a piston slap. Uh, the piston must be repaired, but if the fuel injector is not also repaired, the replacement engine will develop a piston slap on the same cylinder. Perfect example of that was one that I ran into over there at the uh, when I was at the Ford dealer, and I mentioned it went here one time before I think. But there was a guy, there was this truck that had a, a skip on uh, cylinder number five. It was a misfire on cylinder number five. So the the guy that was uh, working on the truck pulled the spark plug out, and it was kind of scorched and burned up looking, and so he. Uh, I said, hmm, I wonder what happened there. And so he put the spark plug back in, and it ran okay. And the next day it came back skipping on that same cylinder. So he pulled the spark plug out again and looked at it, and it was scorched and burned up the same way. It looked like somebody had hit a torch on it. And so he checked the compression, and the compression on every one of the cylinders was within a few, a couple of pounds of 170 pounds. But on that cylinder, it was 125. You got it? So he had 125 pounds on that cylinder. And then he had 170 on the rest of them. So that, uh, what do you suppose would cause the spark plug to get bur blistered and burned up like that whenever, I mean, because of low compression? Gas. Lots of gas. That's actually going to make it run cooler. Really? The thing that had the octane booster and it was jumping across. Not really. There wasn't any octane booster on that. What he basically had here was he had a, an intake valve that wasn't seating good. And so there was a bunch of extra oxygen in there. And what does the oxygen do on a torch whenever you get something red hot and pull the trigger? It just burns it up, you know, it oxidizes it, blows it right out of there. Anyway, uh, so yes. this, is a, this, this gets better. So he determined it had a, a base engine problem. Now, he and I were doing drivability work, which is your, you know, electronics and making the check engine lights go out and, and then troubleshooting and stuff like that. So he sends it over on the line, and the engine guy uh, pulls the heads and does a valve job. And so the guy pulls the heads and does a valve job. That cylinder, see, because of that extra air, was running really, really, really hot. So he takes the, uh, they do a valve job, and they put it all back together. Uh, and whenever they got done, uh, it still had less than optimum power on that cylinder, checking it with the, uh, you know, power balance part of the skin tool thing. And so uh, the shop foreman sent, pull, had him pull the injector out and send it over to me to have me check it. Now, I had a machine that had a flow meter on it that Ford sent to clean injectors and flow test them. I didn't trust the flow test because it wasn't accurate. I could flow test an injector. It wouldn't flow. Tra it would flow test perfectly. I could clean the injectors, and it would run better. And so I just quit using that test, and I, you know, went. But I wasn't told. We're suspecting this injector is causing a misfire. So can you tell me if it needs to be cleaned? He didn't say that. He says check this injector. And so basically, I put some uh, wires in there and energized it and shot some, you know, spray through it. So yeah, it works. I mean, I don't see where there's a bad injector. Well, it turned out the injectors were dirty. Is what was causing that. 
and it basically had to have the injector clean. And whenever the smoke cleared and I cleaned the injectors, it, it cleared that right up. Well, the heat from that really hot run cylinder had been, had got, enough of that had got up there, and it was obviously blowing some uh, stuff back up in the intake right there. Only the injector tip to worry to cook that. But anyway, uh, we didn't find, see, the point is, the base cause of that concern was the valve, but it, there was other things going on too. Initially, he saw a spark plug that looked like this one here. It was just destroyed. You know what I mean? And now that, okay. You didn't show that to your camera. Huh? You didn't show it to your audience. Yeah, I do. Well, they've seen that spark plug before. Oh, yeah. well, they see it now. Yeah. Okay. Hang on just a minute. Hello. Uh, that's the D U F F E L L, I believe. Unless he make it and tell you that better than me, I, I messed that up ever too. I'm always messed up on that. Uh, but just call Leslie, man, and see what she says. Uh, but anyway, that was... Uh... All right, so you look at your radiator. You want to see if your radiators cause it. I was talking about this PT Cruiser that we had. It was overheating, and it basically, uh, we fought with it and fought with it. It would only overheat when you drove it more than 80, out, 80 miles an hour, and it had a turbo on it and all that. And finally... Uh, after having read a bunch of stuff on Identifix about people talking about radiators on those, I didn't see anything wrong with the radiator. You couldn't inspect it until there was a problem with it. Uh, but I put a radiator in it and a thermostat. Of course, we, you know, the thermostat had already been changed, but we changed it again for good measure, and a, and a radiator in it, and all of that overheating went away. It wouldn't overheat if you were driving less than 80 miles an hour, though. What? Yeah. You know, I so mean, if, if you were driving 65, time? if you were driving 70, it would not overheat. But if you cross, if you passed 80 miles an hour and drove there for very long, it would get hot. And so oh, the radiator took care of it. Were these customers NASCAR racers? No, her their son was. Uh -huh. He was driving. He lives up in Birmingham, and he drives up there. If you don't run, it's like Atlanta. You know, if you're running 80 miles an hour up there, you're going to run over. You know, because all the flow of traffic's like 80 miles an hour all the time up there, and so Same that was with the uh, Atlanta Highway in Montgomery. Yeah, that's right. Everyone, yeah. like I actually got the 120, and I still had a semi on my rear end yeah. one day. Bring up, you got to bring it up to operating temperature. Feel the heater core hoses to make sure they're both the same temperature. If they're not, the heater core may need to be replaced. You know, pay attention to stuff like that. Uh, points that can have air restrictions include induction system restrictions, exhaust system restriction. Most restrictions can be identified with visual inspection, but some of them need to be removed to be diagnosed. Uh, to diagnose induction system restrictions, look for collapsed hoses, tubes, or a restricted air filter. You can look at your uh, catalyst for a restriction by shooting and, and a, you know a partially clogged catalyst can cause one to run a little bit too hot but if you got your uh, if you got your uh, temperature gun and you shoot in front of the catalyst and behind the catalyst and it's hotter in front of the catalyst than it is behind it you know you got a stopped up catalyst that's not complicated is it shoot in front of it between the catalyst and the engine should not be hotter than it is coming out of the cat coming out of the cat should be hotter now just because you shot in front of the cat and saw that it was cooler than coming out of the cat you know, if it's hotter than about 200 degrees in front of the cat, or maybe 250, uh, you may still have a problem with the cat. So uh, it doesn't. You haven't exonerated the catalytic converter when you see that it is hotter behind it than it is in front of it. However, if it's hotter in front of it than it is behind it, you have condemned it. You see what I mean? There are some tests that are like that. If it fails the test, it's a, it's a, you're in, you're done with that diagnosis. If it doesn't fail the test, you may need to look a little farther to make sure that there's not a partial failure of that. Um, so we look at induction uh, system restrictions. I had this one guy that I uh, had a Mustang that came in there that would not start, and uh, he was a pretty sharp mechanic, and he worked on that thing for a while trying to figure out what was going on with it. And when the smoke cleared, it turned out that the air filter, the guy had driven into some mud or something, and the air filter was just absolutely had like 10 pounds of mud caked in it. So it couldn't get in the air. But it, the guy had, apparently it was, he didn't want his dad to know he had run it into the mud, and he washed the car really, really, really I good. Remember that. Yeah, he washed that car so good to make it look so pretty. And then whenever it, uh, he finally got around to checking the air filter, which he probably should have done earlier. You don't expect an air filter to cause a new start. You know what I mean? What's the, I mean, that's the last place I'm gonna look too. Well, when he took it apart of there, I mean, it was absolutely just a big muddy block of mess. Is what it was. It was terrible. Except it had all dried and turned into just dry caked mud all over the air filter. Uh, but anyway, the. Uh, uh, okay, so you're gonna you're gonna diagnose the intake system for uh, restrictions. So you may have to remove the intake and visually inspect the manifold. You notice we're getting a little more intrusive as we go here. Uh, to diagnose exhaust system, look for collapsed tubes, 
or you can actually uh, take a, if you take the oxygen sensor out and you screw a little fitting in there like I built in there, or they, they got they sell them too, and you, like I took a, uh, an 18 millimeter, you know, when you buy a catalytic converter or sometimes, or you, you've got an old engine, sometimes instead of having an oxygen sensor in that hole, they'll have a, just a bland plug. You screw that bland plug out of that oxygen sensor hole, which is 18 millimeter spark plug thread, the same thing, and drill a hole through it and tapped it and put a brake bleeder screw in there, and now all of a sudden, You've got a fitting you can screw in there, put a hose on, and check for exhaust restriction without having to, you know, do other things. Okay, so I did that. I have known a muffler shop drilling a hole right in front of the catalytic converter and, you know, the one-eighth hole, and they stick a uh, hose just right up against that one-eighth hole while somebody revs the car up, and if it got more than about two pounds of pressure, and that's right in front of the cat, you'll know the cat stopped up. Uh, but what they did was, uh, they, then they get through with that, they take a one-eighth blind pop rivet, put it in that hole. See, and it, it didn't hurt a doggone thing. you got to be a blind pop rivet, though, so you don't have a little hole there. Um, all right, you're going to be listening to her for, uh, looking for burning or leaking oil. Uh, why is it, does anybody, does everybody know why, why Moody is, I mean, why Lundy is putting the head gaskets on there, on that uh, dodge over there? Because it was leaking Had an oil leak, and it was burning on the exhaust. The first, uh, the way that manifested itself, I'm smelling something burning when I stop, and I look, and the pressurized oil feed that goes through there and feeds the camshafts, right there around that place on the gasket, it was coming out and was dripping all over there. Uh, thing. Now, the, you know, the, the the ratty thing about that thing is the the timing gear set was four hundred and sixty dollars for that truck. It was really expensive, but pull heads and all. If you can put all may as well, since it's high mileage, put all that timing chain stuff in there too. That's what he's doing. Notice this guy in this picture right here is using a black light. Uh, they, UV dye diagnostic inspection kit. Yeah, looks like what we put gasoline in your oil dye. Use uh, you know half an ounce to uh, minimum of 26. Now whatever you know you can put the floor the additive in there. Run it for 15 minutes. Stop it. Look at all the seal and gasket areas for leaks using the master UV inspection kit. And this is a dealership thing. And then you're gonna look to make sure the coolant's at appropriate level in the degas bottle. Degas bottles that plastic bottle over. If it's at the correct level, check the coolant concentration. Now. Uh, you know, whenever you're looking at this bottle over here, some of these bottles are really robust and they're heavy duty and they got a pressure cap on them. That's the ones where you fill the cooling system right there in the degas bottle. If the degas bottle has got a little cap that you just pop off with one finger, that is not going to tell you. It can have plenty of coolant in it and the radiator can be empty. So just because you've got, you know, the degas bottle has got coolant in it on one of those, it's got a, if it's got a cap on the radiator, you know, obviously you don't want to check it hot, but when if it's got a cap on the radiator, you'd be pulling, you'd be checking that. But usually, if you've got something pushing it out of the radiator, somebody hadn't added some to the degas bottle. See, if the customer comes in and they poured some in the degas bottle because they saw it was empty, it could have actually got rid of a bunch more in the radiator they didn't know about. You didn't burn one up like that. You'd be careful with that. Um, allow the engine to run for two minutes. Record the engine coolant temperature sensor voltage, then record it every 60 seconds. When the ECT voltage trend changes direction or only changes slightly from the previous reading, that's thermostat opening voltage. You can watch that on the big screen that we put it on when we're using our uh, ease diagram. Wire, wire the if thermostat opening voltage is greater than 0 0.75 volts and less than 82 or 180 degrees, uh, put a new thermostat in it. You don't want it to be uh, running too cold either. Okay. Uh, you're going to do the injector flow test and so on and so forth. That's something that's, uh, you know, you've got to have a transducer to do that with a machine that we've got even, but uh, injectors are going to be an issue too. I actually had a guy that came in here one time on a Buick, or he had his uh, wife bring it in, and they, some, they were told it needed a head gasket. And so we did some troubleshooting on it, and I said, I don't really see where we've got head gasket issues. I just see an engine skip, and it turned out that the injectors were dirty. We just cleaned the injectors and cleared it right up. He didn't need anything like that, but we did put a thermostat in it, just some, you know, principle for cleaning the injectors, cleared up to skip. Uh, using an ignition tester to make sure all the cylinders are getting sparked. Uh, you can actually, you, you know those spark testers like the one that you see in this picture right here, like the ones we've got, you see that? Um, whenever you're working on one that's coil on plug and you don't have a, a really good scan tool to determine which cylinder is misfiring, uh, you know, and it's not actually throwing you a code, uh, or if it's like, uh, got a periodic boom, 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 a misfire, but it, like I said, it doesn't flash the light or toss any kind of a PO3 series code. You're going to take your, uh, set that thing to about, to where it's about almost between three quarter and an inch, and take the coil out of the hole and ground that thing and let it jump a spark 
right? And if it's not, all of them will be jumping except one usually, and you'll find your weak one like that. You don't even have to have a lot of equipment to do that. Uh, you can do the you know, power balance test and all that. Spark plugs ought to be a light brown color. Uh, spark plug concerns may include oil contamination, carbon foul, glaze insulator, overheating, pre-ignition, detonation damage. We talked about some of that a few minutes ago. Hey, we had a damaged spark plug on that Jeep. You sure did, but that's because of the cylinder had come all to pieces. I mean, the piston had come all to pieces in there. Yeah. All the accessories should be rotated by hand in the unloaded condition. Now, I have known of people pulling an engine out because they say it was locked up and they were going to change it. And it turned out that the doggone water pump had locked up and it's, you know, it had seized up enough to where it stopped the engine. Also, air conditioning compressor, the bearing in the air conditioner compressor pulley can seize up and it can cause that too. Like this, what I'm talking about is this bearing right here. You see this air conditioner hub? That bearing right there, and this is a brand new one. But that bearing right there is the idler that lets that belt spin that thing when the air conditioner is not engaged. Of course, when the air conditioner engages, it clicks in and starts turning inside. If that bearing goes bad, that pulley is big enough to where if that belt's got good traction, it will keep that engine from turning over. It'll go thunk, 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 thunk. And you'll say, oh, we got a locked up engine. And, you know, I say, but what I always do is I get somebody to get on a crank bolt with a balancer, I mean with a uh, breaker bar, and I look down there and I watch the AC compressor and I let them try to turn it. And whenever they turn it, if I see the belt trying to slip and this pulley's not moving, I say, let's take the belt off of it and see if it'll start. Take the belt off of it, it fires up. Then you're going to be feeling for pulleys to see which one is locked. See what I mean? You can also, if you take the belts off, you can spin the pulleys through. Always, whenever you're doing something where you've got the belt off, spin all the pulleys and see what they sound and feel like. You'd be surprised how many times you'll find a bad water pump when all you're doing is changing a belt. Change the belt, feel the water pump, see if it goes, tuh, 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 tuh. hey, this needs a water pump too. That's an upsell. It's a legitimate upsell because these people need to know that their water pump is going to die if they don't do something. Really important. Uh, rotate all the accessories by hand. Also, if you're putting a timing belt on one and the water pump's in there with being pulled with a timing belt, make the dog sure you fill in that water pump. You don't want to, and all, and the, the, all of the uh, little idlers and stuff, those bearings are, are really working hard all, a lot of time. My rule of thumb is whatever's in a really hostile environment is working the hardest is going to fail. It's going to usually be the one that's going to fail first uh, if you've got a whole bunch of components in that system. Uh, you know what the FEAD is? If any of the components of the FEAD do not rotate freely or make noise when rotated by hand, replace the component. What's the FEAD? Front end. Keep going. Sorcery Very good. He's as smart as a whip. Where'd you see that at? He was looking at his on the screen. <laughs> Front end accessory. Now, that's your belt and pulleys, man. Okay. Uh, if the drive belt uh, is outside the installation wear range window, you're going to put a new drive belt on it. The drive belt is too long, so let the drive belt tension the arm go all the way to the arm travel stop under certain load conditions. Uh, so the belt drive cracking can occur at less than 60,000 miles if you're working hard. Yeah. After class, I want to show you something on my truck and see if you can tell me what it is. All right. It's got to do with like five gauges at one time. Smooth. Uh, what I was going to tell you, there was a Ford pickup one time, years and years and years ago. Oh, heck, this is back in the 70s. I was working at a shop in Enterprise. And I uh, came in there, and it was just knocking to beat the band. It sounded horrible. And I said, man, this thing's going to have to have an engine. And so the the old guy that owned the shop says, nah, that's not that much wrong with it. And whenever he... Uh, you know, I couldn't see under the hood really good because it was pulled up in the shop and the lights weren't that good in there. And uh, he just took his pocket knife and cut the belt off of it. And uh, it fell down on the floor and we cranked it up. It was quiet and smooth. And I said, what's up with that? And I switched it back off. And the belt is a V-belt. It had big chunks going out of it. And sometimes when a belt's got big chunks going out of it, it makes it sound like an engine knocking. You know, I said, that's the first time I've ever seen that. Um, but you got to look at your... Uh, what about hydraulic lock? What are they talking about there? Anybody know? Um, Hydraulic lock is when you got coolant or fuel or any kind of liquid that's in there on top of the pistons when it comes up and stops. Uh, that, it's kind of like the one on that car that went in that shop over in uh, the town up the road, and it, it one of our cars, and it, it went in there and uh, needed an intake manifold, which is a plastic intake manifold on the Crown Vickies. You know, it's got water going through it in one spot, and it was leaking a little bit. 
So they managed to pull the manifold off, and somehow they let the, the that water gurgle into one of the cylinders while he had a manifold off, but they didn't do anything and about then it. Had a change of mind. Then when they went to start it up, it actually the piston came up on compression stroke with a bunch of water in it, <coughs> bends the rod, and it's over. And we had to put a motor in it. Well, that engine had 350,000 miles on it anyway. It didn't owe us anything. And we used the new manifold that they had put on it when we put the new engine in it. We popped a new engine in that one. Yeah, I mean, a replacement engine for about 1,300. That, that, that was Willie that did it. Willie did that engine swap. That was the blue one, right? Yeah, the with the red pinstrap. Yeah. The 2000 one. model. Yeah, that was yeah. the one that. They're using it up at the where other. Where they had me use my tiny hands compared to his. Yeah, they're, yeah, well, they're looking up at uh, Greenville campus right now with that one. Uh, pulling spark plugs and rotate the engine by hand. If it turns, water squirts out of one of the spark plug holes. You got, you know, damage in there usually. Uh, in severe cases of hydraulic lock, the engine may not turn by hand. All right. Uh, use the stethoscope to identify the location of an engine noise. Uh, it's really important to be able to do that. Listen at point where the sound's loudest. Determine if it's coming from the top of the engine or the bottom. And you can kill the cylinders too. Use some method to do that and see if it changes the sound, makes it go away or whatever. Compression test. Make sure that all the crankcase is the crank viscosity and then it's full and the battery is charged. Operate it with the engines at normal operating temperature. Turn the switch and switch and remove all the plugs. Now this is easy for them to say. Get that thing good and hot and then pull all the plugs out. Don't you love that? You know what I mean? I'm not usually going to do that. I'm just going to pull the things out and just take, check the compression. Because making getting the engine hot ain't usually going to make it much different. Now, did you guys see the handout I gave you that I got out of that uh, magazine about doing the uh, running compression test and snapping it and looking at the readings? I gave everybody a copy of that. Everybody's an engine repair. I gave you a copy of that. It's really, really, really important. That is something that we had to uh, deal with on uh, on the L1 test and all that. Um, Okay, put a compression gauge in there. If I install an auxiliary starter switch, so you can spin it with a button, uh, with an uh, ignition switch off, and using a starter switch, crank at a minimum of five compression strokes and record the highest uh, reading. Remember, you have to have your throttle in your wide open position if you do it right. Now, a lot of mechanics don't even open the throttle wide open, but you're going to get better compression reading if you go ahead and open the throttle wide open when you're doing that. Okay. Uh, note the approximate number of compression strokes required to obtain the highest reading. Repeat the test on each cylinder, cranking it for the same number of compression strokes. Uh, the indicated compression pressures are supposed to be within the specification if the lowest reading cylinder is within 75% of the highest reading. Uh, refer to the compression pressure limit chart. Uh, if one or more cylinders reads low, put a tablespoon of engine oil on top of the pistons, repeat the compression chest, and check those cylinders. If it improves considerably, piston rings are faulty. Now, you remember the story I told you the other day about how I did one that went from zero compression to 180 because there was a push rod that had come off and was laying down in there? And somebody had floated a valve spinning that thing, and the push rod had basically rattled out of place and down in there. And because it had oil in there and it could suck hard enough, it was able to pull air past, I mean, actually pull air past the intake valve by move, you know, moving the spring a little bit, and then it squeezed it, you know, and that would made me think that there was something wrong with the piston rings when all it really needed was a push rod to put it back in there. That's not in any textbook you're going to find anywhere. Never seen that except in the field on one that I was working on. And you can say, you know, and, and we could probably do it. take one of the uh, intake push rods off of this uh, 350 out here and then do a compression test. You're not going to see any compression. Put oil in there. It's subject to pull that intake valve open, grab some air, and squeeze it, and make you think you got, oh, we got piston ring problems, you know. Um, let's see. Uh, using the compression. You know, now let's get on to the next page. Uh, when a cylinder compression test produces a low reading, use the cylinder leak detection. We've done that before. Uh, I mean, there's actually a, a uh, worksheet out. Have you guys seen that worksheet? Have I given that worksheet out yet on doing a cylinder leakage test? Seen that one? That may be something that's, that we do an engine repair too. I don't remember. Uh, the leakage detector is inserted in the spark plug hole. Piston brought up to dead center on the compression stroke. Compressed air is admitted, and it, it'll basically tell you how much is how much is leaving the cylinder. And you're gonna listen with your ears to see where it's going. If it's going into the crankcase. You'll hear it there. If it's going into the, you're gonna hear a little going into the crankcase past the rings, because the rings are not a perfect seal, are they? If they were, you would not have blowby, and you wouldn't need a PCV system, right? Okay. Uh, while the air pressure is retained in the cylinder, listen for the hiss. You're gonna listen to the, you know, listen to the uh, exhaust, the intake. See if it bubbles up through the coolant. You know, there's a place you need to see where it's going. Rich, what's up with all the pictures of the Miata engine? Or mm -hmm. not the Miata, but the 
That's the neon engine. It's the same engine as what's in that neon. Well, and that's uh, uh, it's hard to tell that that's a neon engine. They've got the compression. I mean, a solar leak is just through the back. Two pages. That's not. That's not. That's under the hood of a Windstar. Windstar. Yeah, that's a Ford Windstar. Is what that is. See that? That don't, that don't look like the Windstar. All right. Uh, it's too small. Uh, actually, it's a V6, and you're only looking at half the engine. Uh, after everything is on, you're going to basically. Uh, this is telling you how to go if you're if you're a dealership mechanic and all that. All right, you're going to get the engine out. Engine procedures are unique for each engine. So you make sure that you know one size doesn't fit all. Uh, you know. Dang! And here I was hoping I could put a 350 in everything. Yeah. Okay. Now see that once again, turn the components that well, as you're coming out, and make sure they're not the root cause of an engine noise. Got to make sure you're doing that. Uh, subsystems or coolant systems, intake air systems, front end accessory drive, and then your fuel system. Uh, make sure that all of the fluids are completely drained from the engine you're going to re you know replace. Uh, allow the oil to completely drain. Drain the coolant. Cover all openings with tape. Remove the fluids from the replaced engine. So this is like a warranty repair. Transfer the required components to the replacement engine, uh, which would be your intake manifold, exhaust manifold, sensors. And you know what the difference between a long block and a short block is? Yeah. Uh, short block is just the main block. And... What does it include? It's got the pistons, but not the head. Yeah, it's got the crank and the pistons and the camshaft, but it doesn't have a head. It got the guts. Not okay, what's the long block got? That's a whole engine. Yeah, usually uh, a long block, one of the ones that I've seen, will basically have the, um, the all the way up to the valve covers. Yeah. You know, and it may even have the wall pan on it. Occasionally, you'll see one without the wall pan, but that's a long block or a short block. When I had the Eclipse, whenever that, whenever I had the problem with it, mm -hmm. I went to AutoZone because I said that they could order. Crate engines and yeah, stuff. Yeah. And they asked if I wanted long block or short block. I was, I want an engine. Yeah. That was my response. Yeah. <laughs> and then I, came, I think I came in and told you about that. Yeah. Well, there was a guy that was a, a kind of a floor sweeper at the Ford place one day. He was talking about he was going to get engine for his uh, wife's Aerostar, and uh, he says they're asking me if I have a long block or a short block. Can you come and look at and tell which one I have? You know, and the truck mechanic I was talking to says, I think I'm going to let you handle this one. <laughs> he walks off, but anyway, it's pretty funny. Uh, all right, oil coolers can trap contaminants from a failed engine, so you need to replace the oil cooler, right? I'll take one. You have to get one. All right, so, and there you go. So you got to put it in there. Always rate, refer to the workshop manual. Make sure it's lined up right. To prevent NVH concerns, noise, vibrations, harshness, make sure the mounts are aligned correctly. And if your mounts are all bound up and everything, and your exhaust system's all bound up, sometimes you'll feel stuff that you wouldn't feel if it's all neutralized. And sometimes what we would have to do is loosen every, all the fasteners, loosen all the mounts, loosen everything up so that the bolts were still there, but they were all really, really loose. And then we would put the engine in reverse and drive, reverse and drive, and then we'll rock around and find out where it wanted to be. And then you tighten all that up and that it would be gone. <laughs> You're just neutralizing the exhaust system and everything, you know. Pretty cool how that works. Uh, and there, you're going to prime the lubrication system. And as much as you can, you know, it's not a bad idea if you're putting a brand new oil pump on one to pack some grease in there. You got me? All right. Let's jump on into our test here. Now let's do the test and make sure that well, you guys probably already know the answers to these. If one or more cylinders reads low, squirt approximately a tablespoon of engine oil on top of the pistons in the low reading cylinders. Repeat the compression pressure check on these cylinders. If the compression improves considerably, the valves are sticking or seating incorrectly. Well, here's what I'm thinking, Rich. I'm thinking this question is looking for the answer false because that said that it would be rings. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. But you said that it sometimes wasn't. Huh? It is false. What were you doing? Is this like a Jeopardy thing? What is false? Yeah, the Jeopardy thing. All right. I don't do Jeopardy. I do Wheel of Fortune. Okay, the engine replacement procedures are the same for each engine. Uh, false. That is false. Whenever a replacement engine is installed, always reuse the oil cooler from the old engine. False. That is false in a big way, right? You have to buy new parts. Okay, now this is something we might not have covered exactly. Crank the engine in 15-second increments, allowing a 30-second cool-down pause between each cranking period. 
to ensure the lubrication system is purged of all air to the highest point of the engine and prevents uh, this prevents lack of lubrication damage when the engine started. Repeat this step two times. Uh, actually, the false. numbers are wrong on that. Don't worry about that. It's supposed to, you know, put faults on that because you're actually, you know, it's not quite exactly like that. But uh, you'd basically, what you basically need to know is you don't want to start it up dry. You know, when I'm building an engine, I like to put some stuff in there, whatever it may be. There's stuff you can get for building engines to make sure that the bearings are, are greasy or wet and have, you know, lubrication when they're first starting until oil comes up there. i tell you something that I don't like. Is there a break-in period, too, for yeah. going engines? It depends on the engine. Uh, and the uh, the break-in period is different from engine to engine. I understand mm -hmm. that, but I mean, there, there's generally a break-in period. Yeah, absolutely. Everything's got to learn where it's supposed to. Everything's got to get sort of burnished into where it's riding, you know, the bearings and the rings and all that kind of stuff. And I, uh, I yeah. know on one engine that I had to deal with it was a 3,000 yep. mile like break-in period. When my dad built one of those bug engines, uh, like, you know, he built a brand new bug engine for somebody, what he would do is he'd have them bring it back when it had 500 miles on it and he would change the oil and adjust the valves and check to make sure everything was still tight and okay. I mean, but that was a 500 mile thing. And the bug engine, you know, you do an oil change over 1,500 miles on the old bugs because they didn't have an oil filter on them. So, yeah, they were just straight up. Yeah. Oil engine. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, but anyway, the uh, indicated compression pressures are considered within specification if the lowest reading cylinder is within 65% of the highest. True or false? Mm. You remember that number? False. 75%. The lowest needs to be within 75% of the highest. Some symptoms of a vehicle that has exhaust concerns include? Uh, lost power. Mm -hmm. um, All the erratic coolant and temperature readings. All of the above. Aww. Yep. And here I was wanting to... Me and this guy that I was training, me and this guy that I was training, and he was kind of a jumpy guy, we're out there uh, doing uh, injector cleaning on a tempo one time, and the exhaust had a little bit of restriction. It was running a little hotter than they usually do, and so when we got through with the injector cleaning, he was disconnecting the machine from it, and some of the gas, you know, trickled out of the machine down there. We had the car switched off, but that exhaust was hot enough to where it was past the flash point on that gas line and set the gas on fire. And there was flames looking up from between the engine and the bulkhead. And he was dancing around going, hoo, 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 hoo. <laughs> and I said, I said, Mark, here's the fire extinguisher watch. This is what you do, you know. I had a guy out here one time that was, he had pulled a starter off the GMC and put it back on. And somehow when he put it back on, he got the, the positive cable touching the solenoid wire. And whenever he went to, you know, put the battery cable on there, it started spinning over. And so he pulled the cable out, and he was just standing there while the truck was just spinning and spinning and spinning, doing like this, turning around and around in circles, you know. And I was thinking, take the battery cable off, dodo. You know, you just gonna let it keep spinning until it runs, burns the starter up. I mean, you know, you have to move quick, and sometimes. Yeah, like that. I, I know there was a failure recently where something went wrong. Yeah. It involved that big black monster outside. Yeah, you're talking about the. Uh, Bronco. The Quincy incident. Oh, yeah, the Quincy incident. I remember that story. But uh, <laughs> bless his heart, Quincy took the brake pedal. He didn't know this was a problem. He took he took the brake uh, switch off because it was part of an exercise. And he was taking a stoplight switch off. Well, to do that, you got to pull the pin, pull the stoplight switch off, and that disconnects the master cylinder from the brake pedal. And then Quincy says, well, it's about time to go home. I'll just I'll go on to the house. And so he leaves the thing sitting there, and the brake pedal is just flopping around. Well, uh, one of the dual enrollment students wanted to uh, back it outside. I said, crank it up, let it run for a little warm up. And he goes, I want to back it outside. And I said, okay. Well, whenever an experienced driver gets in a vehicle, if the brake pedal is flopping around and is not doing anything, you're not typically going to go anywhere on it. You're going to find out what in the sandhill is going on with the brake. Well, this kid right here, it was a perfect storm. Everything went wrong that could go wrong. He puts the doggone thing in drive instead of reverse. Wow. 
somehow puts it in drive. Either that or it just or it click, 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 and it went into drive, and then it starts moving forward, and he's stabbing the brake, and the brake won't stop the vehicle, and it pushes the workbench out of the way, and it knocks a Honda off the lift. On the lift. Yeah. And it was an old ratty Honda with oxidized paint. It was probably worth $100, but she couldn't care less. You know, she said, oh, it had been the fender. To that lift, uh, you know, those, those lift arms, that they lock, unless somebody has pulled the things up, if they lock. And that, that kept the car from falling all the way to the floor. Basically, the fender caught the thing, and it didn't come all the way down. So we, we had to take extraordinary measures to get that thing off the lift and all that kind of didn't stuff. Did you have to have the forklift? Uh, yeah, we, well, I actually used that little uh, powertrain lift. It was a, we had to get this done, I mean, before something worse happened. And that's why the, the cylinder, the, uh, the ram is blown on that powertrain lift. Because I, I used it to help get that thing off. And we got that, it off of that, that explains so much. Yeah, it does. And I've got to get another rim for it. But anyway. The hydraulic one that... Yeah, the hydraulic thing that when that's air operated, it leaks, you know. Yeah, yeah kind of... Uh, but that thing's old anyway. It's been here for 20 years, you know. How much but, does that uh, ram cost? Oh, probably 500 bucks. But, uh, How much does that tool work to you? Yeah. The way it is? Huh? What are you talking about? Oh, power that powertrain power lift. Oh, it's worth... A, it's probably a $2,500, $3,000... Tool. Even with it broken. Even with it broken. Uh, okay. Especially if I'm almost. Now, the truck on? huh? The have the truck on? No. no. That that lift is a pedal operated the air lift thing I wanted to use. Oh. It's yeah. The blue one that doesn't work. Yeah, it actually works, but it it leaks down. You yeah, know, like so very rapid. Yeah. Yeah. So we're gonna. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a tra it's a powertrain lift and all that. Up. Okay. I'm so. Uh, that but, well, we're having a good off. time here. Uh, and, uh, all right, we're going to do this uh, to ensure the system is... Oh, what I started to back up and say, what Quincy should have done if he didn't want something like this to happen is he should have disabled the vehicle where you couldn't even start it, or he should have put a big note on the steering wheel that says brake pedal disconnected or no brakes or something like that, you know. But it was a sleeper. It was just sitting there waiting for the perfect storm, you know what I mean? Well, you see, it wasn't all Quincy's fault, but... He caused the storm to brew. Yeah, he was that the one the that high schooler that jumped in it. Yeah, he was the first lightning. He lit the match that started the fire. Basically, is what he did uh, to ensure the system is fully bled. And that's talking about the cooling system. Start the engine. Turn the fan control to high with a temperature selector at maximum heat. While the engine's idling, ensure the hot air is blowing from the heat ducts and engine coolant temp gauge should read the normal range. Upper radiator hose should feel hot to the touch. All do up. All of the above. During a cylinder leak down test, leakage in excess of how much is uh, excessive? 30, 25. I'd say 20. More than 20 is a problem. Before performing a compression test, you should make sure the oil in the crankcase is of correct viscosity uh, and correct level. Make sure the vehicle at normal operating temperature. Remove the spark plugs. I'm telling you, you're gonna, you ain't going to see very many mechanics that's going to get that thing blistering hot before they pull the plugs out, particularly if they're hard to get to. I'm sorry, y'all. But that's what, you know, choice is e. yeah, E is what you're supposed to open the throttle wide. That's all about. Rich, you ready to be amazed by the...